Chapter 25, America Moves to the City, 1865 to 1900. Those of you who've been reading the American pageant for the last couple of chapters will notice that the dates are the same as the last chapter uh, and the chapter before. So chapter 23 has been the politics of the era. 24 has been more about the economics, the industry coming of age. And this one is more about the urbanization of America. Again, all during the period which we call Reconstruction, which, as you notice from the earlier dates, overlaps a little bit with Reconstruction from Chapter 22. So Chapter 25. Born in the country, America moved to the city in the decades following the Civil War. By the year 1900, the United States' upsurging population nearly doubled from its level of some 40 million souls enumerated in the census of 1870. Yet in the very same period, the population of American cities tripled. By the end of the 19th century, four out of ten Americans were city dwellers, in striking contrast to the rustic population of stagecoach days. This cityward drift affected not only the United States, but most of West, the Western world. European peasants, pushed off the land in part by competition from cheap American foodstuffs, were pulled into cities in both Europe and America by the new lure of industrial jobs. A revolution in American agriculture thus fed the industrial and urban revolutions in Europe as well as in the United States the urban frontier. The growth of American metropolises was spectacular. In 1860, no city in the United States could boast a million inhabitants. By 1890, New York, Chicago, and Philadelphia had vaulted past the million mark. By 1900, New York, with some three and a half million people, was the second largest city in the world, outranked only by London. Cities grew both up and out. The cloud-brushing skyscraper allowed more people and workplaces to be packed into a parcel of land. Appearing first as a 10-story building in Chicago in 1885, the skyscraper was made usable by the perfecting of the electric elevator. An opinionated Chicago architect, Louis Sullivan, contributed formidably to the further development of the skyscraper with his famous principle that form follows function. Nesting lawfully above city streets in the new steel, steel skeleton high-rises that Sullivan helped to make popular, many Americans were becoming modern cliff dwellers. Americans were also becoming commuters, carted daily between home and job on the mass transit lines that radiated out from central cities to surrounding suburbs. Electric trolleys, powered by a wagging antenna over, from overhead wires, propelled city limits explosively outward. The compact and commutable, communal walking city, its boundaries fixed by the limits of leg power, gave way to the immense and impersonal megalopolis, carved into distinctly different districts for business, industry, and residential neighborhoods which were in turn segregated by race, ethnicity, and social class. Rural America could not compete with the siren song of the city. Industrial jobs, above all, drew country folks off the farms and into factory centers. But the urban lifestyle also held powerful attractions. The pre-dawn milking of cows had little appeal when compared with the late-night glitter of city lights. Electricity, indoor plumbing, and telephones, whose numbers leapt from some 50,000 in 1880 to over a million in 1900, all made life in the big city more alluring. Engineering marvels like the skyscraper and New York's awesome Brooklyn Bridge, a harps-like suspension span dedicated in 1883, further added to the seductive glamour of the gleaming cities. You can see that picture on, on the next page. Cavernous department stores such as Macy's in New York and Marshall Fields in Chicago attracted upper, no, urban middle-class shoppers and provided urban working-class jobs, many of them for women. The bustling emporiums also heralded a dawning of era of consumerism and accentuated the widening class divisions. When Carrie Niebuhr, a novelist, Theodore Dreiser's fictional heroine in, in Sister Carrie, escapes from the rural boredom to Chicago just before the turn of the century, it is the spe spectacle of the city's dazzling department stores that awakens her fateful yearning for a richer, more elegant way of life, for entry into the privileged urban middle class, whose existence she had scarcely imagined in the rustic countryside. The move to the city introduced Americans to new ways of living. Country dwellers produced little household waste. Domestic animals or scavenging pigs ate food scraps on the farm. Rural women mended or darned worn clothing rather than discarding it. Household products were sold in buck, bulk at the local store without wrapping. Mail order houses such as Sears and Montgomery Ward, which increasingly displaced the rural general store in the late 19th century, at first did not list trash barrels or garbage cans in their catalogs. In the city, however, goods came in throwaway bottles, boxes, bags, and cans. Apartment houses had no adjoining barnyards where residents might toss garbage to the hogs. Cheap, ready-to-wear clothing and swiftly changing fashions pushed old suits and dresses out of the closet and into the trash heap. Waste disposal, in short, was an issue new to the urban age, and the mountains of waste that urban cities 
I'm sorry, urbanites generated, further testified to a cultural shift away from the virtues of thrift to the conveniences of consumerism. The jagged skyline of America's perpendicular civilization could not fully conceal the canker sores of a feverish growth. Criminals flourished like lice in the teeming asphalt jungles. Sanitary facilities could not keep pace with the mushrooming population explosion. Impure water, uncollected garbage, unwashed bodies, and droppings from draft animals enveloped many cities in a satanic stench. Baltimore was described as smelling like a billion polecats. The cities were monuments of contradiction. They represented humanity compressed, remarked one observer, the best and the worst combined in a strangely composite community. They harbored merchant princes and miserable paupers, stately banks and sooty factories, green grass suburbs and treeless ghettos, towering skyscrapers and stinking tenements. The glaring contrast that assaulted the eye in New York reminded one visitor of a lady in ball costume with diamonds in her ears and her toes out at the boots. Worst of all were the human pigsties known as slums. They seemed to grow ever more crowded, more filthy, and more rat-infested, especially after the perfection in 1879 of the Dumbbell Tenement. So named because of the outline of its floor plan, the Dumbbell was usually seven or eight stories high, with shallow, sunless, and ill-smelling air shafts providing minimal ventilation. Several families were sardined onto each floor at the barrack-like structures, and they shared a melodious toilet in the hall. In these fetid warrens, conspicuously in New York's lung block, Hundreds of unfortunate urbanites coughed away their lives. Flop houses, abandoned where their half-starved and unemployed might sleep for a few cents on verminous mattresses, small wonder that some of those slum dwellers drove mightily to escape their wretched surroundings, as many of them did. The slums remained foul places, inhabited by successive waves of newcomers. To a remarkable degree, hard-working people moved up and out of them. But although they escaped the old ghetto, they generally resettled in other urban neighborhoods, alongside people of the same ethnicity or religion. The wealthiest left the cities altogether and headed for the semi-rural suburbs. These leafy bedroom communities eventually ringed the brick and concrete cities with a green belt of affluence. The new immigration. Keep in mind as we read this that um, this will be a changing uh, group than the Irish and the Germans from the 1840s. So you're going to be asked in AP to look for the continuities and change over several themes, and immigration is one of those themes. The powerful pull of the American urban magnet was felt even in faraway Europe. A brightly colored stream of immigrants continued to pour in from the old mother continent. In each of the three decades from the 1850s through the 1870s, more than two million migrants had stepped onto America's shores. By the 1880s, the stream had swelled to a rushing torrent, as more than five million cascaded into the country. A new high for a single year was reached in 1882, when 788,992 arrived, or more than 2,100 a day. Until the 1880s, most immigrants had come from the British Isles and Western Europe, chiefly Germany and Scandinavia. They were typically fair-skinned Anglo-Saxon and Teutonic types, and they were usually Protestant, except for the Catholic Irish and many Catholic Germans. Many of them boasted a comparatively high rate of literacy and were accustomed to some kind of representative government. Their old country ways of life were such that they fit relatively easily into American society, especially when they took up farming, as many did. But in the 1880s, the character of the immigrant stream changed drastically. The so-called new immigrants came from the southern and eastern Europe. Among them were Italians, Croats, Slovaks, Greeks, and Poles. Many of them worshipped in Orthodox churches or synagogues, they came from countries with little history of democratic government, where people had grown accustomed to cringing before despotism, and where opportunities for advancement were few. Largely illiterate and impoverished, most new immigrants preferred to seek industrial jobs in jam-packed cities rather than move out to farms. These new peoples totaled only 19% of the importing immigrants in the 1880s, but by the first decade of the 20th century, they constituted an astonishing 66% of the total inflow. They hived together in cities like New York and Chicago, where Little Italy's and Little Poland soon claimed more inhabitants than many of the largest cities of the same nationality in the Old World. Some Americans feared that these new immigrants would not or could not assimilate uh, to life in their new land, and they began asking if the nation had become a melting pot or a dumping ground. Southern Europe uprooted. Why were these bright shawled and quaint jacketed strangers hammering on the gates? In part, they left their native countries because Europe seemed to have no room for them. The population of the Old World was growing vigorously. It nearly doubled in the century after 1800, thanks in part to an abundant supplies of fish and grain from America and to the widespread cultivation in Europe of that humble New World transplant, the potato. 
American food imports and the galloping pace of European industrialization shook the peasantry loose from its ancient habits and customary occupations, creating a vast footloose army of the unemployed. Europeans, by the millions, drained out of the countryside and into European cities. Most stayed there, but some kept moving and left Europe altogether. About 60 million Europeans abandoned the old continent in the 19th and early 20th centuries. More than half of them moved to the United States. But that striking fact should not obscure the important truth that masses of people were already in motion in Europe before they felt the tug of America. Immigration to America was in many ways a byproduct of the urbanization of Europe. America fever proved highly contagious in Europe. The United States was often painted as a land of fabulous opportunity in the American letters sent by friends and relatives already transplanted, letters that were soiled by the hands of many readers. We eat here every day, wrote one jubilant Pole, what we get only for Easter in our native country. The land of the free was also blessed with freedom from military conscription, the draft, and institutionalized religious persecution. So the land of opportunity and freedom was the, the belief. And they learned this from American letters, letters from America from their families. Profit-seeking Americans trumpeted throughout Europe the attractions of the new promised land. Industrialists wanted low-wage labor. Railroads wanted buyers for the land grants. States wanted more population, and steamship lines wanted more human cargo for their holds. In fact, the ease and cheapness of steam-powered shipping greatly accelerated the trans-oceantic trans voyage. As the century lengthened, savage persecutions of minorities in Europe drove many shattered souls to the American shores. In the 1880s, the Russians turned violently upon their own Jews, chiefly in the Polish areas. Tens of thousands of these battered refugees, survivors of centuries of harassment as hated outcasts, fled their burning homes. They made their way to the seaboard cities of the Atlantic coast, notably New York. Jews had experienced city life in Europe, a circumstance that made them virtually unique among new immigrants. Many of them brought their urban skills of tailoring or shopkeeping to American cities. Destitute and devout Eastern European Jews were frequently given a frosty reception not only by the old stock Americans, but also by those German Jews who had arrived decades earlier and prospered in the United States, some as garment manufacturers who now con con um, condescendingly employed their co-religious as cheap labor. Many of the immigrants never intended to become Americans in any case. A large number of them were single men who worked in the United States for several months or years and then returned home with their hard-earned roll of American dollars. Some 25% of the nearly 20 million people who arrived between 1820 and 1900 were birds of passage who eventually returned to their country of origin. For them, the grip of the magnet of America was never that strong. Even those who stayed in America struggled heroically to preserve their traditional culture. Catholics expanded their parochial school system, and Jews established Hebrew schools. Foreign language newspapers abounded. Yiddish theaters, kosher food stores, Polish parishes, Greek restaurants, and Italian social clubs all attested to the deep desire to keep old ways alive. Yet time took its toll on these efforts to conserve the customs of the old world and the new. The children of the immigrants grew up speaking fluent English, sometimes mocking the broken grammar of their parents. They often rejected the old country manners of their mothers and fathers in a desire to plunge headlong into the mainstream of American life. Reactions to the new immigration. America's government system, nurtured in, in wide open spaces, was ill-suited to the cement force of the great cities. Beyond minimal checking to weed out criminals and the insane, the federal government did virtually nothing to ease the assimilation of immigrants into American society. State governments, usually dominated by rural representatives, did even less. City governments, overwhelmed by the sheer scale of rampant urban growth, proved woefully inadequate to the task. By default, the business of ministering to the immigrants' needs fell to the unofficial quote-unquote governments of the urban political machines led by bosses like New York's notorious Boss Tweed. Taking care of the immigrants was big business indeed. Trading jobs and services for votes, a powerful boss might claim the loyalty of thousands of followers. In return for the support at the polls, the bosses provided jobs on the city's payroll, found housing for new arrivals, tied it over the needy with gifts of food and clothing, patched up minor scrapes with the law, and helped get schools, parks, and hospitals built in immigrant neighborhoods. Reformers gagged at the cynical exploitation of the immigrant vote, but the political boss gave valuable assistance that was forthcoming from no other source. The nation's social conscience, slumbering since the anti-slavery crusade, gradually awakened to the plight of the cities, and especially their immigrant masses. Prominent in this awakening were several Protestant clergymen who sought to apply the lessons of Christianity to the slums and factories. Noteworthy among them was Walter Rauschenbach, who in 1886 became pastor of a German Baptist church in New York City. Also conspicuous was Washington Gladden, who took over a congregational church in Columbus, Ohio in 1882. 
preaching the social gospel, they both insisted that churches tackle the burning issues, social issues of the day. The Sermon on the Mount, they declared, was the science of society, and many social gospelers, uh, gospelers predicted that socialism would be the logical outcome of Christianity. These Christian socialists did much to prick callous middle-class consciousness, thus preparing the path for the progressive reform movement after the turn of the century. A little footnote, the Sermon on the Mount is, Blessed are the poor and the meek and the needy, they shall inherit the earth. And so they took that part of the Bible as a calling card to make it socialist. One middle-class woman who was deeply dedicated to uplifting the urban masses was Jane Addams. Born into a prosperous Illinois family, Addams was one of the first generation of college-educated women. Upon her graduation, she sought out other outlets for her large talents than could be found in teaching or charitable volunteer work, then the only permissible occupations for a young woman of her social class. Inspired by a visit to England in 1889, she acquired the, acquired the de decaying Hull Mansion in Chicago. There she established Hull House the most prominent, though not the first, American settlement house. Soft-spoken but tenacious, Jane Addams became a kind of urban American saint in the eyes of many admirers. The philosopher William James told her, you, utterly, you utter indistinctly the truth we others vainly seek. She was a broad-gauge reformer who courageously condemned war as well as poverty, and she eventually won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1931. But her pacifism also earned her the enmity of some Americans, including the Daughters of the American Revolution, who choked on her anti-war views and expelled her from membership in her august organization, in their august organization. Located in a poor immigrant neighborhood of the Greeks, Italians, Russians, and Germans, Hull House offered instruction in English, counseling to help newcomers cope with the American big city life, child care service for working mothers, and cultural activities for neighborhood residents. Following Jane Addams' lead, women founded settlement houses in other cities as well. Conspicuous among those houses was Lillian Wald's Henry Street Settlement in New York, which opened its doors in 1893. The settlement houses became centers of women's activism and social reform. The women of Hull Houses successfully lobbied in 1893 for an Illinois anti-sweatshop law that protected women workers and prohibited child labor. They were led, in this case, by the black-clad Florence Kelly, a guerrilla warrior in the urban jungle. Armed with the insights of socialism and endowed with the voice of an actress, Kelly was a lifelong battler for the welfare of women, children, blacks, and consumers. She later moved to the Henry Street Settlement in New York and served for three decades as General Secretary of the National Consumers League. The pioneering work of Adams, Wald, and Kelly helped to blaze the trail that many women and some men later followed into careers in the new profession of social work. These reformers vividly demonstrated the truth that the city was the frontier of opportunity for women, just as the wilderness had been for men. I want to pause there for a minute because that's a theme that you may have to write about, that the city was the frontier of opportunity for women. The urban frontier opened new possibilities for women. More than a million women joined the workforce in a single decade in the 1890s. Strict social codes prescribed which women might work and what jobs they might hold. Because employment for wives and mothers was considered taboo, the vast majority of working women were single. Their jobs depended on their race, ethnicity, and class. Black women had few opportunities beyond domestic service. White-collar jobs such as social workers, secretaries, department stores, clerks, and telephone operators were largely reserved for native-born women. Immigrant women tended to cluster in particular industries as Jewish women did in the garment trades. Although hours were often long, pay low, and advancement limited, a job still bought women, working women some economic and social independence. After contributing a large share of their earnings to the families, many women still had enough money to, in their pocketbooks to enter a new urban world of sociability. Excursion to amusement parks with friends on days off, Saturday night dances with the fellas. Okay, again, you might want to pause, think of city. How did that open up opportunity for women? And the period is now over. Now ring the welcome mat. Anti-foreignism, or quote-unquote nativism, earlier touched off by the Irish and German arrivals in the 1840s and 1850s, bar barred its ugly face in the 1880s with fresh ferocity. The new immigrants had come from much the same old as the old to escape the poverty and squalor of old Europe and to seek the new opportunities in America. But nativists viewed the Eastern and Southern Europeans as culturally and religiously exotic hordes and often gave them a rude reception. The newcomers, the newest newcomers, aroused widespread alarm. Their high birth rate, common among people with a low standard of living, and sufficient youth and vigor to pull up stakes, raised worries that the original Anglo-Saxon stock would soon be outnumbered and outbred. 
Sorry. Still more horrifying was the prospect that it would be mongrelized by a mixture of inferior Southern European blood, and that the fairier Anglo-Saxon types uh, would disappear. One New Englander cried with an out in anguish, O oh, Liberty, white goddess, is it well to leave the gates unguarded? These quote-unquote Native Americans voiced additional fears. They blamed the immigrants for the degradation of urban government. Trade unionists assailed the alien arrivals for their willingness to work for starvation wages that seemed to, to them like princely sums, and for importing in their intellectual baggage dangerous doctrines such as socialism, communism, and anarchism. Many business leaders who had welcomed the flood of cheap manual labor began to fear that they had embraced a Frankenstein's monster. Anti-foreign organizations, reminiscent of the know-nothings of antebellum pre-Civil War days, were now revived in a different guise. Notorious among them was the American Protective Association, APA, which was created in 1887 and soon claimed a million members. In pursuing its nativist goals, the APA urged voting against Roman Catholic candidates for office and sponsored the publication of lustful fantasies about runaway nuns. <laughs> Sorry, that just strikes me as funny. Organized labor was quick to throw its growing weight behind the move to choke off the rising tide of foreigners. Frequently used as strike breakers, the wage depressing immigrants were hard to unionize because of the language barrier. Labor leaders argued, not illogically, that if American industry was entitled to protection from foreign goods, American workers were entitled to protection from foreign laborers. Congress finally nailed up partial bars against the importing immigrants. The first restrictive law passed in 1882 banged the gate shuts in the faces of paupers, criminals, and convicts, all of whom had to be returned at the expense of the greedy or careless shipper. Congress further responded to pained outcries from organized labor when, in 1885, it prohibited the importation of foreign workers under contract, usually for substan substandard wages, so contract labor. In later years, other federal laws lengthened the list of undesirables to include insane, polygamists, prostitutes, alcoholics, anarchists, and people carrying contagious diseases. A proposed literacy test, long a favorite among nativists because it favored the old immigrants over the new, met vigorous opposition. It was not enacted until 1917, after three presidents had vetoed it on the grounds that literacy was more a measure of opportunity than intelligence. The year 1882, in addition to the first federal restrictions on immigration, brought forth a law to bar completely one ethnic group, the Chinese uh, Exclusion Act. You can see that on page 514, we talked about that in class. Hitherto America, at least officially, had embraced the oppressed and underprivileged of all races and creeds. Hereafter the gates would be padlocked against defective undesirables, plus the Chinese. Four years later, in 1886, the Statue of Liberty arose in New York Harbor, a gift from the people of France. On its base was inscribed the words of Emma Lazarus, Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, your wretched refuse of your teeming shore. To many nativists, those noble words described only too accurately the scum washed up by the new native, new, sorry, new immigrant tides. Yet the uprooted immigrants, unlike natives, lucky enough to have had parents who caught an earlier ship, became American citizens the hard way. These new immigrants stepped off the boat, many of them full-grown and well-muscled, ready to put their shoulders to the nation's industrial wheels. The Republic owes much to these latecomers for their brawn, their brains, their courage, and the yeasty diversity they brought to American society. Churches confront the urban challenge. The swelling size and changing character of the urban population posed sharp challenges to American churches, which, like other national institutions, had grown up in the country. Protestant churches, in particular, suffered heavily from the shift to the city, where many of the traditional doctrines and pastoral approaches seemed irrelevant. Some of the larger houses of worship, with their stained glass windows and thundering pipe organs, were tending to become merely sacred diversions or amusements. Reflecting the wealth of their prosperous par parishioners, many of the old line churches were distressingly slow to raise their voices against social and economic vices. John D. Rockefeller was a pillar of the Baptist Church, J.P. Morgan of the Episcopal Church, Trinity Episcopal Church in New York actually owned some of the city's worst slum property. Cynics remarked that the Episcopal Church had become, quote, the Republican Party at prayer. Some religious leaders began to worry that the age-old struggle between God and the devil, the wicked one, was registering dismaying gains. The mounting emphasis on material was on materialism. Too many devotees worshipped at the altar of avarice, greed. Money was the accepted measurement of achievement. And the new gospel of wealth proclaimed that God caused the righteous to prosper. Into this spreading moral vacuum stepped a new generation of urban revivalists. Most conspicuous was former Chicago shoe salesman Dwight Lyman Moody. Like many of those who he preached, 
to whom he preached, Moody was a country boy who had made good in the big city. Proclaiming a gospel of kindness and forgiveness, Moody was mo uh, a modern urban circuit rider who took his message to countless American cities in the 1870s and 1880s. Clad in a dark business suit, the bearded and rotund Moody held huge audiences spellbound. When he preached in Brooklyn, special trolley tracks had to, had to be laid to carry the crowds who wanted to hear him. Moody contributed powerfully to the adapting the old-time religion to the facts of city life. The Moody Bible Institute, founded in Chicago in 1889, continued to carry on his work after his death in, in 1899. Almost kind of like the Great Awakening, but for cities. Simultaneously, the Roman Catholic and Jewish faiths were gaining enormous strengths from the new immigration. By 1900, the Roman Catholics had increased their lead as the, sites, the largest single denomination, numbering nearly 9 million communicants. Roman Catholic and Jewish groups kept the common touch better than many of the leading Protestant churches. Cardinal Gibbons, an urban Catholic leader devoted to American unity, was immensely popular with Roman Catholics and Protestants alike. Acquainted with every president from Johnson to Harding, he employed his liberal sympathies to assist the American labor movement. By 1890, the variety-loving Americans could choose from 150 denominations, two of them newcomers. One was the band-playing Salvation Army, whose soldiers without swords invaded America from England in 1879 and established a beachhead on street corners. Appealing frankly to the down-and-outers, the boldly named Salvation Army did much practical good, especially with free soup. The other important new faith was the Church of Christ Scientist, Christian Science, founded by Mary Baker Eddy in 1879, after she had suffered much ill health. Preaching that the true practice of Christianity heals sickness, she set forth her views in a book entitled Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, which sold an amazing 400,000 copies before her death. A fertile field for converts was found in America's hurried, nerve-wracked, and urbanized civilization, to which Eddie held out the hope of relief from discords and disease through prayer, as taught by Christian science. By the time she died in 1910, she had founded an influential church that embraced several thousand, hundred thousand devoted worshippers. Urbanites also practiced or participated in a new kind of religious affiliated organization, the Young Men's Christian and Women's Christian Associations, the YMCA, and the WCA, established in the United States before the Civil War, grew by leaps and bounds, combining physical and other kinds of education with religious instruction. The Ys appear, appeared in virtually every major American city by the end of the 19th century. Darwin disrupts the churches. The old-time religion received many blows from modern trends, including a booming sale of books on comparative religion and on historical criticism as applied to the Bible. Most unsettling of all was On the Origin of Species, a highly controversial volume published in 1859 on the eve of the Civil War by the English naturalist Charles Darwin. He set forth in lucid form the sensational theory that humans had slowly evolved from other forms of life, a theory that was soon summarized to mean the survival of the fittest. Evolution casts serious doubt on a literal interpretation of the Bible, which relates how God created the heaven and earth in six days. The conservatives, or fundamentalists, stood firmly on the scripture as the inspired and infallible word of God, and they condemned what they thought was the bestial hypothesis of the Darwinians. The modernists parted company with the fundamentalists and flatly refused to accept the Bible in its entirety as either history or science. This furious battle over Darwinism created rifts in the churches and colleges of the post-Civil War era. Modernist clergymen were removed from their pulpits, Teachers of biology who embraced evolution were dismissed from their chairs. But as time wore on, an increasing number of liberal thinkers were able to reconcile Darwinism with Christianity. They heralded the revolutionary theory as a newer and grander revelation of the ways of the Almighty. As one commentator observed, some call it evolution, and others call it God. But Darwinism undoubtedly did much to loosen religious moorings and to promote unbelief among the gospel-glutted. The most bitterly denounced skeptic of the era was a golden tongue orator, Colonel Robert Ingersoll, who lectured widely on some mistakes of Moses and why I am an agnostic. He might have gone far in public life if he had stuck to politics and refrained from attacking orthodox religion by giving hell hell, as he put it. Lust for Learning Public education continued its upward climb. The ideal of tax-supported elementary schools adopted on a nationwide basis before the Civil War was still gathering strength. Americans are accepting the truism that a free government cannot function successfully if the people are shackled by ignorance.
Beginning about 1870, more and more states were making at least a grade school education compulsory, mandatory, and this gain, incidentally, helped check the frightful abuses of child labor. Spectacular indeed was the spread of high, school, high schools, especially by the 1880s and 1890s. Before the Civil War, private academies at the secondary level were common, and tax-supported high schools were rare, numbering only a few hundred. But the concept was now gaining impressive support that the high school education, as well as the grade school education, was the birthright of every citizen. By 1900, there were some 6,000 high schools. In addition, free textbooks were being provided in increasingly qu increasing quantities by the taxpayers of the states during the last two decades of the century. Other trends were noteworthy. Teacher training in schools, then called normal schools, experienced a striking expansion after the Civil War. In 1860, there were only 12 of them. In 1910, over 300. Kindergartners, early bar earlier, earlier borrowed from Germany, also began to gain strong support. The new immigration in the 1880s and 1890s brought vast new strength to the private Catholic parochial schools, which were fast becoming a major pillar of the nation's educational structure. Public schools, though showering benefits on children, excluded millions of adults. This uh, deficiency was partially remedied by the Chautauqua movement, a successor to the Lyceums, which was launched in 1874 on the shores of Lake Chautauqua in New York. The organizers achieved gratifying success through nationwide public lectures, often held in tents and featuring well-known speakers, including the witty Mark Twain. In addition, there were extensive Chautauqua courses of home study, for which 100,000 people enrolled in 1892 alone. Crowded cities, despite their cancers, generally provided better educational facilities than the old one-room, one-teacher rent schoolhouse. The success of the public schools is confirmed by the falling of a literacy rate from 20% in 1870 from to 10% in uh, 1900. Americans were developing a profound faith, often misplaced in formal education, as the sovereign remedy for their ills. No comment. Booker T. Washington and Education for Black People War-torn and impoverished, the South lagged far behind other regions in public education, and African Americans suffered most severely. And African American, a staggering 40%, 44% of non-whites were illiterate in 1900. Some help came from Northern philanthropists, but the foremost champion of black education was an ex-slave, Booker T. Washington, who had slept under a board sidewalk to save pennies for his schooling. Called in 1881 to head the black normal and industrial school at Tuskegee, Alabama, he began with 40 students in a tumble-down shanty. Undaunted, he taught black students useful trades so that they could gain self-respect and economic security. Washington's self-help approach to solving the nation's racial problems was labeled accommodationist because it stopped short of directly challenging white supremacy. Recognizing the depths of Southern white racism, Washington avoided the issue of social equality. Instead, he grudgingly acquiesced in segregation in return for the right to develop, however modestly and painstakingly, the economic and educational resources of the black community. Economic independence would ultimately be the ticket, Washington believed, to black political and civil rights. Washington's commitment to training young blacks in agriculture and the trades guided the curriculum at Tuskegee Institute and made it an ideal place for a for slave-born George Washington Carver to teach and research. After Carver joined the faculty in 1896, he became an internationally famous agricultural chemist who provided a much-needed boost to the southern economy by discovering hundreds of new uses for the lowly peanut, shampoo, axle grease, sweet potato, vinegar, and soybean paint. Other black leaders, notably W.E.B. Du Bois, Du Bois assailed, from Booker T. Wa assailed sorry, Booker T. Washington as an Uncle Tom who was con condemning their race to manual labor and perpetual inferiority. Born in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, Du Bois was a mixture of African, French, Dutch, and Indian blood. Thank God no Anglo-Saxon, he would, it would add. After a determined struggle, he earned a Ph.D. at Harvard, the first of his race to achieve his, this goal. The honor, I assure you, was to Harvard, he said. <laughs> he demanded complete uh, equality for blacks, social as well as economic, and helped to found the National Association of Advancement for Colored People, or the NAACP, in 1910. Rejecting Washington's gradualism and separatism, he demanded that the talented tenth of the black community be given full and immediate access to the mainstream of American life. An exceptionally skilled historian, sociologist, and poet, he died as a self-exile in Africa in 1963 at the age of 95, 
Many of Du Bois' differences with Washington reflected the contrasting life experiences of Southern and Northern blacks. That is something you should definitely know. What is the difference between Washington and Du Bois' outlook on solving the race issue? Also, keep in mind, Du Bois is from, du Bois is from the, the North, Washington from the South. You may want to reread that section. The Hollowed Halls of Ivy. Colleges and universities also shot up like lusty young saplings in the decades after the Civil War. A college education increasingly seemed indispensable in the scramble for the golden apple of success. The educational battle for women, only partially won before the war, now turned into a rout of the masculine diehards. Women's colleges such as Vassar were gaining ground, and universities open to both genders were blossoming, notably in the Midwest. By 1900, every fourth college graduate was a woman. But the turn of the century as well, the black institutes and academies planted during the Reconstruction era had blossomed into a crop of southern black colleges. Howard University in Washington, D.C., Hampton Institute in Virginia, Atlanta University, and numerous others nurtured higher education for blacks until the civil rights movement in the 1960s made attendance at white institutions possible. The truly phenomenal growth of higher education owed much to the Morrill Act of 1862. This enlightened law, passed after the South had seceded, provided a generous grant of the public lands to the states for support of education. Land-grant colleges, most of which became state universities, in turn bound themselves to provide certain services, such as military training. The Hatch Act of 1887, extending the Morrill Act, provided federal funds for the establishment of agricultural ex experiment stations in connection with the land-grant colleges. Footnote for you Massachusetts students. Uh, UMass started out as a Massachusetts Agricultural uh, School in, in Amherst uh, due to the Morrill Act. And several of the buildings on campus are is called Morrill, the Morrill Building. Private philanthropy richly supplemented federal grants to higher education. Many of the new industrial millionaires developing tender social uh, consciousness uh, donated immense fortunes to educational enterprises. A philanthropist who was cynically described as, quote, one who steals privately and gives publicly. In the 20 years from 1878 to 1898, these money barons gave away about $150 million. Noteworthy among the new private universities of high quality to open were Cornell and Leland Stanford, Leland Stanford Jr., 1871, the latter founded in memory of the deceased 15-year-old's only child of uh, a builder of the Central Pacific Railroad. The University of Chicago, opened in 1892, speedily forged into a front-rank position, owing largely to the lubricant of John D. Rockefeller's oil millions. Rockefeller died at 97 after having given some $550 million for philanthropic purposes. Significant also was the sharp increase in professional and technical schools, where modern laboratories were replacing the solo experiments performed by instructors in front of their classes. Towering among the specialized institutions was John Hopkins University, opened in 1876, which maintained the nation's first high-grade graduate school. Several generations of American scholars, repelled by snobbish English cousins and attracted by painstaking continental methods, had attended German universities. John Hopkins ably carried on the Germanic tradition of profusely footnoted tomes. Reputable scholars, I'm sorry, reputable scholars no longer had to go abroad for a gilded edge graduate degree. Dr. Woodrow Wilson, among others, received his PhD from John Hopkins. He eventually becomes president. The March of the Mind. Cut and dried, the old classical curriculum in the colleges was on its way out as the new industrialization brought insistent demands for practical courses and specialized training in the sciences. The elective system, which permitted students to choose more courses in cafeteria fashion, was gaining popularity. It received a powerful boost in the 1870s when Dr. Charles W. Eliot, a vigorous young chemist, became president of Harvard College and embarked upon a lengthy career of educational statesmanship. Medical schools and medical science after the Civil War were prospering. Despite the enormous state, I'm sorry, despite the enormous sale of patent medicines and so-called Indian remedies, good for man or beast, the new scientific gains were reflected in improved public health. Revolutionary discoveries abroad, such as those of the French scientist Louis Pasteur and the English physician Joseph Lister, left their imprint on America. Uh, Pasteur is uh, where we get the pasteurization from, and uh, Lister is from the term Listerine, uh, which is a bacteria killer. They both discovered uh, bacteria. The popularity of heavy whiskers waned as the century ended. Such hairy adornments were now coming to be regarded as germ traps. As a result of new health-promoting precautions, including campaigns against public spitting, life expectancy at birth was measurably increased. 
One of America's most brilliant intellectuals, the slight and sickly William James, served for 35 years on the Harvard faculty. Through his numerous writings, he made a, cheap, a deep mark on many fields. His principles of psychology helped to establish the modern discipline of behavioral psychology. In The Will to Believe, 1897, and Varieties of Religious Experience, 1902, he explored the philosophy and psychology of religion. In his most famous work, Pragmatism, he colorfully described America's greatest contribution to the history of philosophy. The concept of pragmatism held that truth was to be tested, above all, by practical consequences of an idea, by acting rather than theories, by action rather than theories. This kind of reasoning aptly expressed the philosophical temperament of a nation of doers. The Appeal for the Press Books continued to be a major source of edification and enjoyment, for improvement and enjoyment, for both juveniles and, and adults. Bestsellers of the 1880s were generally old favorites like David Copperfield and Ivanhoe. Well-stocked public libraries, the Poor Persons University, were making encouraging progress, especially in Boston and New York. The magnificent Library of Congress building, which opened its doors in 1897, provided 13 acres of floor space in the largest and costliest edifice of its kind in the world. A new era was inaugurated by the generous gifts of Andrew Carnegie. This open-handed Scotsman, book-starved in his youth, contributed $60 million for the construction of public libraries all over the country. By 1900, there were about 9,000 free circulating libraries in America, each with at least 300 books. It's around this time that the Pittsfield Library is built. Uh, <clears throat> Roaring newspaper presses, spurred by the invention of the linotype in 1885, more than kept pace with the demands of a world-hungry, word-hungry public. But the heavy investment in machinery and plant was accompanied by a growing fear of offending advertisers and subscribers. Bare-knuckled editorials were, to an increasing degree, being supplanted by feature articles and non-controversial syndicated material. The day of slashing journalistic giants like Horace Greeley was passing. Sensationalism at the time, the same time, was capturing the public taste. The semi-literate immigrants, combined with strap-hanging urban commuters, created a profitable market for news that was simply and punchily written. Sex, scandal, and other human interest stories burst into the headlines as the vulgarization of the press accompanied the growth of circulation. Critics now complained in vain of these prostitutes. Two new journalistic tycoons emerged. Joseph Pulitzer, Hungarian-born and near-blind, was a leader in the techniques of sensationalism in St. Louis, and especially with the New York world. His use of the colored comic supplements featuring the Yellow Kid gave the name Yellow Journalism to his lurid sheets. A close and ruthless competitor was the youthful William Randolph Hearst, who had uh, been expelled from Harvard College for a crude prank. I wish I knew what it was. I don't know what it was. Able to draw on his California father's mining millions, he ultimately built up a powerful chain of newspapers, beginning with the San Francisco Examiner in 1887. Unfortunately, the overall influence of Pulitzer and Hearst was not altogether wholesome. Although both championed many worthy causes, both prostituted the press in their struggle for increased circulation, both stooped, snooped, and scooped to conquer their flair for scandal and sensational rumor was happily somewhat offset by the introduction of syndicated material and by the strengthening of the news-gathering associated press, which had been founded in the 1840s. Apostles of Reform Magazines partially satisfied the public's appetite for good reading, notably old standbys like Harper's, The Atlantic Monthly, and Scribner's Monthly. Possibly the most influential journal of all was the liberal and highly intellectual New York Nation which was read largely by professors, preachers, and publicists as the weekly day of judgment. Launched in 1865 by Irish-born Edward Godkin, uh, remember Godkin's name, you'll see him in a lot of sources we see in DBQs, uh, a merciless critic, it crusaded militantly for civil service reform, honesty in government, and a moderate tariff. The nation attained only modest circulation of about 10,000 in the 19th century, but Godkin believed that if he could reach the right 10,000 leaders, his ideas through them might reach the tens of millions. Another journalist author, Henry George, again, Henry George, you'll see that name in a lot of DBQ docs, uh, was an original thinker who left an endearing mark. Poor and formal schooling, he was rich in idealism and the milk of human kindness. After seeing poverty at its worst in India and land grabbing at its greediest in California, he took pen in hand. His classic treatise, Progress and Poverty, undertook to solve the greatest enigma of our times, the association of progress with poverty. According to George, 
the pressure of growing population on a fixed supply of land unjustifiably pushed up property values, showering unearned profits on owners of land. A single 100% tax on those windfall profits would eliminate unfair inequalities and stimulate economic growth. George soon became a most controversial figure. His single tax ideas were so horrifying to the propertied classes that his manuscript was rejected by numerous publishers. Finally brought out in 1879, the book gradually broke into the bestseller lists and ultimately sold some 3 million copies. George also lectured widely in America, where he influenced thinking about the maldistribution of wealth, and in Britain, where he left an indelible mark on English Fabian socialism. Edward Bellamy, a quiet Massachusetts Yankee, was another journalist reformer of remarkable power. In 1888, he published a socialistic novel, Looking Backward, in which the hero, falling into a hypnotic sleep, awakes in the year 2000. He looks backward and finds that the social and economic injustices of 1887 have melted away under an idyllic government which has nationalized big business to serve the public interests. To a nation already alarmed by the trust evil, the book had a magnetic appeal and sold over a million copies. Scores of Bellamy clubs sprang up to discuss this mild utopian socialism, and they heavily influenced American reform movements near the end of the century. Post-war writing. As literacy increased, so did book reading. Post-Civil War Americans devoured millions of dime novels, usually depicting the wilds of the woolly wests. Paint-bedaubed Indians and quick-triggered gunmen like Deadwood Dick shot off vast quantities of powder and virtually invariable, tr invariably triumphed. These lurid paperbacks were frowned upon by parents, but goggle-eyed youth read them in, in haylofts or in schools behind the broad covers of geography books. The kind of dime novelist was Harlan Halsey, who made a fortune by dashing off about 650 novels, often one in a day. General Lewis Wallace, a lawyer, soldier, author, was a colorful figure. Having fought with distinction in the Civil War, he sought to combat the prevailing wave of Darwinism skepticism with his novel Ben-Hur, A Tale of the Christ. A phenomenal success, the book sold an estimated 2 million copies in many languages, including Arabic and Chinese, and later appeared on the stage and screen. It was the Uncle Tom's Cabin of the anti-Darwinists who found it who found in it support for the Holy Scriptures. Even more popular writer was Horatio Alger, a Puritan-reared New Englander who, in 1866, forsook the pulpit for the pen. Deeply interested in New York newsboys, he wrote more than a hundred volumes of juvenile fiction that sold over a hundred million copies. His stock formula was that virtue, honesty, and industry are rewarded by success, wealth, and honor a kind of survival of the purest, especially among non-smokers, non-drinkers, non-swearers, and non-liars. Although Algiers' own bachelor life was criticized, he implanted morality on the conviction that there is always room at the top, especially if one is lucky enough to save the life of the boss's daughter and marry her. So this is kind of a rags-to-riches story that became very popular in American mythology. Perfect for the Gilded Age. In poetry, Walt Whitman, Whitman was one of the few luminaries of yesteryear who remained active. Although shattered in health by service as a Civil War nurse, he brought out successive and purified revisions of his hardy perennial Leaves of Grass. The assassination of Lincoln inspired him to write two of the most moving poems in American literature, O oh, Captain, My Captain, and When Lilacs Last in the Dooryard Bloomed. The curious figure of Emily Dickinson, one of America's most gifted lyric poets, did not emerge until 1886 when she died and her poems were discovered. A Massachusetts recluse, she wrote over a thousand short lyrics on scraps of paper. Only two were published during her lifetime, and those without her consent. As she wrote, How dreary to be somebody, how public like a frog to tell your name, the live long June to an admiring bog. Uh, by the way, her uh, home is still standing in Amherst, Massachusetts, down the road, and you can see that and visit it. Among the lesser poetical lights was a tragic southerner, Sidney Lanier. He was, an, he was oppressed by poverty and ill health and torn between flute playing and poetry. Dying young of tuberculosis, he wrote some of his finest poems while afflicted with a temperature of 104 degrees. He is perhaps best known for the Marshes of Glynn, a poem of faith inspired by the current clash between Darwinism and Orthodox religion. Literary Landmarks In novel writing, the romantic sentimentality of a youthful era was giving way to a rugged realism that reflected more faithfully the materialism of an industrial society. American authors now turned increasingly to the coarse human comedy and drama of the world around them to find their subject. Two Missouri-born authors with deep connections to the South brought altogether new voices to the late 19th century. 
literary scene. <laughs> the darling femini- the daring feminist uh, author Kate Chopin wrote candidly about adultery, suicide, and woman's ambition in the awakening. Largely ignored in her own day, uh, Chopin was rediscovered by later readers who cited her work as suggestive of the feminist yearnings that stirred beneath the surface of respectability in the Gilded Age. Mustachioed Mark Twain had leapt to fame with the celebrated jumping frog of Calvaris County and the Innocence Abroad. He teamed up with Charles Dudley Warner in 1873 to write The Gilded Age, an acid satire of post-Civil War politicians and speculators. The book gave the name to an era. With its scanty formal schooling in the frontier Missouri, Twain typified a new breed of American authors in revolt against the elegant refinements of the old New England school of writing. Christened Samuel Longhorn Clemens, he had served for a time as a Mississippi riverboat pilot and later took his pen name, Mark Twain, from the boatman's cry that meant two fathoms. After a brief stint in the armed forces, Twain journeyed westward to California, a trip he described with a mixture of truth and tall tales in Roughing It, 1872. Many other books flowed from Twain's busy pen, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer and The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn rank among American masterpieces, though initially regarded as trash by snobbish Boston critics. His later years were soured by bankruptcy growing out of unwise investments, and he was forced to take to the lecture platform and amuse what he called the damned human race. A great tribute was paid to his self-totored genius and to American letters when England's Oxford University awarded him an honorary degree in 1907. Journalist, humorist, satirist, and foe of social injustice, he made his most enduring contribution in recapturing frontier realism and humor in the architect, I'm sorry, in the authentic American dialect. Another author who wrote out of the West and achieved at least temporary fame and fortune was Bret Hart. A fabulously dressed New Yorker, Hart struck it rich in California with gold rush stories, especially The Luck of Roaring Camp and The Outcast of Poker Flat. Catapulted suddenly into notoriety by these stories, he never again matched their excellence or their popularity. He lived out his final years in London as little more than a hack writer. Lovely. William Dean Howells, a printer's son from Ohio, could boast of little schoolhouse education, but his busy pen carried him high into the literary circles of the East. In 1871, he became the editor-in-chief of the prestigious Boston-based Atlantic Monthly, and was subsequently presented with honorary degrees from six universities, including Oxford. He wrote about ordinary people and about contemporary and sometimes controversial social themes. A modern instance deals with the once taboo subject of divorce. The rise of Silas Lapham describes the trials of a newly rich paint manufacturer caught up in the caste system of Brahmin Boston. A Hazard of New Fortunes uh, portrays the reformers, strikers, and socialists in the Gilded Age New York. Stephen Crane, the 14th son of a Methodist minister, also wrote about the seamy underside life in, in urban industrial America. His Maggie, A Girl of the Streets, a brutal tale about a poor prostitute driven to suicide, was too grim to find a publisher. Crane had to have it printed privately. He rose quickly to prominence with the Red Badge of Courage in 1895, the stirring story of a bloodied young Civil War recruit, fresh fish under fire. Crane himself had never seen a battle and wrote entirely from the printed Civil War records. He died of tuberculosis in 1900 when only 29. Henry James, brother of Harvard philosopher William James, was a New Yorker who turned from law to literature, taking his dominant theme from confrontation of innocent Americans with subtle Europeans. James penned a remarkable number of brilliant novels, including Daisy Miller, The Portrait of a Lady, and The Wings of a Dove. His book, The Bostonians, was one of the first novels about the rising feminist movement. James frequently made women his central characters, exploring their inner reactions to complex situations with the deafness that marked him as a master of psychological realism. Long resident in England, he became a British subject shortly before his death. Candid portrayals of contemporary life and social problems were the literary order of the day by the turn of the century. Jack London, famous as a nature writer in such books as The Call of the Wild, turned to depicting an impossible, impossible fa- uh, fascistic revolution in The Iron Heel. Frank Norris, like London, a Californian, wrote The Octopus, an earthly saga of the stranglehold of the railroad and corrupt politicians on California wheat ranchers. A sequel, The Pit, dealt with ranking and breaking of speculators on the Chicago Wheat Exchange. Two black writers, Paul Lawrence Dunbar and Charles W. Chestnut, brought another kind of realism to late 19th century literature. Dunbar, through poetry, particularly his acclaimed lyrics of lowly life, and Chestnut, through fiction stories, Short stories in the Atlantic Monthly and the Conjure Woman, 
embraced the use of black dialect and folklore, previously shunned by black authors, to capture the spontaneity and richness of Southern black culture. Conspicuous among the new social novelists rising in the literary firmament was Theodore Dreiser, a homely, gangly writer from Indiana. He burst upon the literary scene in 1900 with Sister Carrie, a graphically realistic narrative of a poor working girl in Chicago and New York. She becomes one man's mistress, then elopes with another, and finally strikes it out on her own to make a career on the stage. The fictional Carrie's disregard for prevailing moral standards so offended Dreiser's publisher that the book was soon withdrawn from circulation, though it later reemerged as an acclaimed American classic. The New Morality Victoria Woodhull, who was real flesh and blood, uh, also took the pillars of conventional morality when she publicly proclaimed her belief in free love in 1871. Woodhull was a beautiful and eloquent divorcee, sometimes stockbroker, and tireless feminist propagandist. Together with her sister, Tennessee Claflin, she published a far-out periodical, Woodhull and Claflin's Weekly. The sisters again shocked a respectable society in 1872 when their journal struck a blow for the new morality by charging that Henry Ward Beecher, the most famous preacher of his day, had for years been carrying on an adulterous affair. Pure-minded Americans sternly resisted these affronts to their moral principles. Their foremost champion was a portly crusader, Anthony Comstock, who made lifelong war on immoral, on the immoral. Armed after 1873 with a federal statute, the notorious, quote, Comstock Law, the self-appointed defender of sexual purity boasted that he had confiscated no fewer than 202,679 obscene pictures and photos, 4,185 4, boxes of pills, powders, etc., used for abortionists, and 26 obscene pictures framed on walls of saloons. His proud claim was that he had driven at least 15 people to suicide. The antics of the Woodhull sisters and Anthony Comstock exposed to daylight the battle going on in late 19th century America over sexual attitudes and the place of women. Switchboards and typewriters in the booming cities became increasingly the tools of women's liberation. Economic freedom encouraged sexual freedom, and the new morality began to be reflected in soaring divorce rates, the spreading practice of birth control, and increasingly frank discussion about sexual topics. By 1913, said one popular magazine, the chimes had rung six o'clock in America. Families and women in the city. The new urban environment was hard on families. Paradoxically, the crowded cities were emotionally isolating places. Urban families had to go it alone, separated from clan, kin, and village. As families increasingly became the virtually exclusive arena for intimate companionship and for emotional and psychological satisfaction, they were subjected to unprecedented stress. Many families cracked under the strain. The urban era launched the era of divorce. From the late 19th century dates the beginning of the divorce revolution that transformed the United States' social landscape in the 20th century. Urban life also dictated changes in work habits and even in family size. Not only fathers, but mothers and even children as young as 10 years old often worked, and usually in widely scattered locations. On the farm, having many children meant having more hands to help with hoeing and harvesting, but in the city, more children meant more mouths to feed, more crowding in sardine tin tenements, and more human baggage to carry in the uphill struggle for social mobility. Not surprisingly, birth rates were still dropping and family size count continued to shrink as the 19th century lengthened. Marriages were being delayed and more couples learned the techniques of birth control. The decline in family size, in fact, affected rural Americans as well as urban dwellers and old stock natives as well as new immigrant groups. Women were growing more independent in the urban environment, and in 1898, they heard the voice of a major feminist prophet, Charlotte Perkins Gilman. In that year, the free-thinking and original-minded Gilman published Women and, Econom and Economics, a classic of feminist literature. A distant relative of Harriet Beecher Stowe and Catherine Beecher, Gilman displayed the restless temperament and reforming zeal characteristic of the remarkable Beecher clan. Strikingly handsome, she shunned traditional feminine frills and instead devoted herself to a vigorous regimen of physical exercise and philosophical meditation. In her masterwork of 1898, Gilman called on women to abandon their de dependent status and contribute to the larger life of the community through productive involvement in the economy. Rejecting all claims that biology gave women a fundamentally different character from men, she argued that, quote, our highly specialized motherhood is not so advantageous as believed. She advocated centralized nursing, nurseries and cooperative kitchens to facilitate women's participation in the workforce, anticipating by more than a half a century the daycare centers and convenience food services of a later day. 
Fiery feminists also continued to insist on the ballot. They had been demanding the vote since before the Civil War, but many high-minded female reformers had temporarily shelved the cause of women to battle for the rights of blacks. In 1890, militant suffragists formed the National American Women's Suffrage Association. Its founders included aging pioneers like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who helped organize the first Women's Rights Con Convention in 1848, and her longtime comrade Susan B. Anthony, the radical Quaker Spitfire, who had courted jail by trying to cast a ballot in the 1872 presidential election. By 1900, a new generation of women had taken command of the suffrage battle. Their most effective leader was Carrie Chapman Catt, a pragmatic and businesslike reformer of relentless dedication. Significantly, under Catt, the suffragists de-emphasized the argument that women deserved the vote as a matter of right because they were all, in all respects, the equals of men. Instead, Catt stressed the desirability of giving women the right to vote if they were to continue to discharge their traditional duties as homemakers and mothers in the increasingly public world of the city. Women had special responsibility for the health of the family and the education of the children, the argument ran. On the farm, women could discharge these responsibility in the separate sphere of the isolated homestead, but in the city, they needed a voice on boards of public health, police commissions, and school boards. By thus linking the ballot to a traditional definition of women's role, suffragists registered encouraging gains. As the new century opened, despite continuing showers of rotten eggs and the jeers of male critics who insisted that women were, making, were made for loving, not for voting, women were increasingly permitted to vote in local elections, particularly on issues related to the schools. Wyoming Territory, later called the Equality State, granted the first unrestricted suffrage to women in 1869. This important breach of the dike once made, many, steps, many states I'm sorry, followed Wyoming's example. Paralleling these triumphs, most of the states by 1890 had passed laws to permit wives to own or control their property after marriage. City life was also, fo also fostered the growth of the spate of women's organizations, including the General Federation of Women's Clubs, which counted some 200,000 members in 1910. The reborn suffrage movement and other women's organizations ex excluded black women from their ranks. Fearful that an integrated campaign would compromise his efforts to get the vote, the National American Women's Suffrage Association limited memberships to whites. Black women, however, created their own associations. Journalist and teacher Ida B. Wells inspired black women to mount a nationwide anti-lynching crusade. She also helped launch the Black Women's Club movement, which culminated in the establishment of the National Association of Colored Women in 1896. Know the effect on cities on women. That's a big one. Prohibition of alcohol and social progress. Alarming gains by demon rum spurred the temperance reformers to redouble zeal. Especially obnoxious to them was the Shutter Door Corner Saloon, appropriately called the Poor Man's Club. The barroom helped keep both him and his family poor. Liquor consumption had increased during the nerve-wracking days of the Civil War, and immigrant groups accustomed to alcohol in the old country were hostile to restraints. Whiskey-loving foreigners in Boston would rudely hiss temperament lecturers. Many tipplers charged, with some accuracy, that temperance reform amounted to a middle-class assault on working-class lifestyles. The National Prohibition Party, organized in 1869, polled the strengthening of votes in some of the ensuing presidential elections. Among the favorite songs of these sober souls were I'll marry no man if he drinks, vote down the vile traffic, and the drunkard's doom. Typical was this. Now all young men a warning take, and shun the poisoned bowl. T'will lead you down to hell's dark gate, and ruin your own soul. Militant women entered on the alcoholic arena, notably when the Women's Christian Temperance Union was organized in 1874. The white ribbon was a symbol of purity. The saintly Frances Willard, also champion of Planned Parenthood, was its leading spirit. Less saintly was a muscular and mentally deranged Kansas cyclone Carrie A. Nation, whose first husband had died of alcoholism. With her hatchet, she boldly smashed saloon bottles and bars with her hatchetations, brought considerable disrepute to the prohibition movement because of her violence and the one-woman crusade. But rum was now on the run. The potent anti-saloon league was formed in 1893, with its members singing, The saloon must go and vote for cold water, boys. Female supporters saying the lips that touch liquor must never touch mine. Statewide, statewide prohibition, which had made surprising gains in Maine and elsewhere before the Civil War, was sweeping new states in the dry column. The great triumph, but only a temporary one, came in 1919 when the National Prohibition Amendment, the 18th, was attached to the Constitution. 
Banners of other social crusaders were aloft. The American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty of Animals was created in 1866, after its founder had witnessed brutal brutality to horses in Russia. The American Red Cross was launched in 1881 with the dynamic and diminutive uh, five-foot-tall Clara Barton at an angel of Civil War battlefields at the helm. Artistic triumphs. We're almost done, folks. John Adams had anticipated that his generation's preoccupation with na na nation-building would allow art to flourish in the future, but the results long proved unspectacular. Portrait painting continued to, to appeal, as it had since the colonial area, but many of America's finest painters were living abroad. James Whistler did much of his work, including the celebrated portrait of his mother, in England. This eccentric and quarrelsome Massachusetts Yankee had earlier been dropped from West Point after failing chemistry. Had Silicon been a gas, he later jested, I would have been a major general. Another gifted portrait painter, likewise self-exiled in England, was John Singer Sargent. His flattering but somewhat superficial likeness of the British nobility was highly prized. Mary Cassatt, an American in exile in Paris, painted sensitive portrayals of women and children that earned her a place in the pantheon of the French Impressionist painters. Other brush-wielders, no less talented, uh, brightened the artistic horizon. Self-taught George Innes, uh, who looked like a fanatic with his long hair and piercing gaze, became America's leading landscapist. Thomas Eakins attained a high degree of realism in his paintings, a quality not appreciated by portrait sitters who wanted their moles overlooked. Boston-born Winslow Homer, uh, who as a youth had secretly drawn sketches in school, was perhaps the greatest painter of the group. Earthly American and largely res resistant to foreign influences, he revealed rugged realism and boldness of conception. His canvases of the sea and fisher folk were masterly, and probably no American artist has excelled to him in portraying the awesome power of the ocean. Probably the most gifted sculptor yet produced by America was Augustus St. Gaudens. Born in Ireland of an Irish mother and a French father, he became an adopted American. Among his most moving works in the, in the Robert Gold Shaw Memorial re, is the Robert Gold Shaw Memorial, erected in Boston in 1897. It depicts Colonel Shaw, a young white Boston Brahmin officer, leading his black troops into the battle in the Civil War. Music, too, was gaining popularity. America of the 1880s and 1890s was assembling high-quality symphony orchestras, notably in Boston and Chicago. The famed Metropolitan Opera House of New York was erected in 1883. In its fabled Diamond Horseshoe, the newly rich, often under the pretense of enjoying the imported singers, would flaunt their jewels, gowns, and furs. While symphonies and operas were devoted to bringing European music to an elite American audience, new strains of homegrown American music were sprouting in the South. Black folk traditions, like spirituals and ragged music, was evolving into the blues, ragtime, and jazz, which would transform American popular music in the 20th century. A marvelous discovery was the reproduction of music by mechanical means. The phonograph, though a squeakily imperfect instrument when invented by the deaf Edison, had by 1900 reached over 150,000 homes. Americans were rapidly being dozed with canned music as the sitting room piano increasingly gathered dust. In addition to skyscraper building, Louis Sullivan, a famous American architect of the age, was Henry H. Richardson, born in Louisiana and educated at Harvard and in Paris. Richardson settled in Boston, and from there spread his immense influence throughout the eastern half of the United States. He popularized a distinctive ornamental style that came to be known as Richardsonian. High vaulted arches like those on Gothic churches were his trademark. His masterpiece and most famous work was the Marshall Field Building in 1885 in Chicago. Enjoying his success, Richardson was noted for his capacity for champagne, his love of laughter, and the bright yellow vests he sported. A revival of classical architecture forms and a setback for realism came with the Great Columbian Exhibition. Held in Chicago in 1893, it honored the 400th anniversary of Columbus's first voyage. This so-called dream of loveliness, which was visited by 27 million people, did much to, to raise American artistic standards and promote city planning, although many of the spectators were attracted primarily by the contortions of the Hoochie Coochie Dancer, Little Egypt. <laughs> The business of amusement, fun and frolic, were not neglected by the workaday American. The pursuit of happiness, heralded in the Declaration of Independence, had by centuries end become a frenzied scramble. People sought their pleasures fiercely, as they had overrun their co continent fiercely, and now they had more time to play. Very diversions beckoned. As a nation of joiners, contemptuous of royalty, American incessantly sought to escape from democratic equality in the aristocratic 
hierarchy of lodges. The legitimate stage still flourished as appreciative audiences uh, rebonded to the lure of the floodlights. I'm sorry, the footlights. Uh, Vaudeville, with its coarse jokes and graceful acrobats, continued to be immensely popular during the 1880s and 1890s, as were minstrel shows in the South, now performed by black singers and dancers rather than by blackface whites as in the North before the Civil War. The circus, high-tented and multi-ringed, finally emerged full-blown. Phineas T. Barnum, the master showman who had early discovered that the public likes to be humbugged, joined hands with James A. Bailey in 1881 to stage The Greatest Show on Earth, which is now the Ringland Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus. <clears throat> Colorful Wild West shows, first performed in 1883, were even more distinctly American. <clears throat> Headed by the nightly goateed and free-drinking William F. Buffalo Bill Cody, the troupe included war-whooping Indians, live buffalo, and dead-eye marksmen. Among them was a girlish, <clears throat> the girlish Annie Oakley. Rifle in hand, she could, at 30 paces, perforate a tossed-up card half a dozen times before it fluttered down to the ground. Hence the term Annie Oakley for a punch ticket, later for a free pass. Baseball, already widely played before the Civil War, was clearly emerging as a national pastime, if not a national mania. A league of professional players was formed in the 1870s, and in 1888, an all-star baseball team toured the world, using the pyramids as a backdrop while in Egypt. A gladiatorial trend towards spectator sports rather than participative sports was exemplified by football. This rugged game was, in its dangerous flying wedge, uh, had become popular well before the 1889, when Yale men Walter C. Camp chose the first All-American team. The Yale-Princeton game in 1893 drew 50,000 cheering fans, while foreigners jeered that the nation was getting sports on the brain. Even pugilism, with its long background of bare-knuckled brutality, gained a new and gloved respectability in 1898. Agile Gentleman Jim Corbett, a scientific boxer, wrestled the world championship from the aging and alcoholic John Sullivan, the fabulous Boston strong boy. Two crazes swept the country in the closing decades of the century. Croquet had become all the rage, though condemned by moralists of the naughty 90s because it exposed feminine ankles and promoted flirtation. The low-framed safety bicycle came to replace the high-seated model. By 1893, a million bicycles were in use, and thousands of young women, jokesters remarked, were turning to this new spinning wheel, one that, offended, one that offered freedom, not tedium. Basketball was invented in 1891 by James Namath, a YMC instructor in Springfield, Massachusetts. Designed as an active indoor sport that could be played during the winter months, it spread rapidly and enjoyed enormous popularity in the next century. The land of the skyscraper was plainly becoming more standardized, owing largely to new industrialization, although race and ethnicity assigned urban Americans to distinctive neighborhoods and workplaces to an increasing degree, they shared a common popular culture, playing, reading, shopping, and talking alike. As the century drew to a close, the explosion of cities paradoxically made Americans more diverse and more similar at the same time.